faced by the deep state, fighting for independence, thinking about revolution, looking for alternative solutions. The enemies of the deep state will tell you what others even don't dare to think. Manuel Oxenreiter and Mateusz Piskorski. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. This is again the podcast, Die Guten Menschen, Public Enemies of the Deep State. My name is Manuel Oxenreiter. I am editor-in-chief of the German news magazine Zuerst. And I am speaking as always uh, to my friend and colleague Mateusz Piskorski in Poland. Hello, Mateusz. You look great today. Hello, uh, you look even greater. So uh, glad to see you and uh, uh, well, uh, welcome to all of our listeners and uh, those who are watching us. We have uh, today a very interesting topic, and I think it is uh, um, it is for our listeners also very interesting because I believe that this is one of the very few topics where even the people I would say who we would consider to be in our peer group that there the opinion is split about. What would you say? I think this is one of the very few topics uh, where you will find. Uh, people who are um, taking one side, but also people who take the other side. And uh, we have to say, uh, we are we are not here to judge on pe people. So both sides have very good arguments. And we are going today to discuss um, the question of South Caucasus, the question of Nagorno-Karabakh, the war, um, the truce, um, the agreement which was signed. And I think it will be very interesting. What do you think? Well, uh, it's uh, interesting, but uh, I would like just to say that uh, we shouldn't, uh, you know, go into a too emotional way of uh, interpreting such uh, conflicts. I mean, it's not an appeal to you, but to uh, to those people you have mentioned, uh, uh, to those people uh, you have mentioned, and who are emotionally supporting one or another side. Actually, I don't know what emotions are. I don't know. I never heard about. Uh, well, <laughs> you know those those people often, which is quite which is quite funny. Those people often uh, claim that they support uh, one of the mm -hmm. sides of such a conflict, but on the other hand, I don't think that any side of the conflict, I mean uh, the side they support realizes that they have their support and <laughs> i don't think that it changed the whole map of uh, of support uh, if uh, someone from the anti-system opposition somewhere supports uh, either armenia or azerbaijan in that case yes let us let us put it on on fix it on on two points uh, we are speaking about geopolitics and not about a football match where it is about cheering up one side and Frankly speaking, I mean, I'm not speaking now about the Armenians and the Assyrians, uh, that they are very emotional in this topic. I totally can understand. But I speak about the fanboys from the West, from either one or the other side. So I totally agree. There was sometimes, to me, the impression as if we are watching a long-term football match where it's about uh, cheering up. And uh, let us say the other point, um, the term support, and I know that maybe a lot of listeners will hate me for this, so maybe you must now rescue the situation. But uh, support, the term support often means in these circles to press once in a while a like button. So I totally agree. If, if, if these guys press like or not, uh, doesn't help either the army of Nagorno-Karabakh nor the army of Azerbaijan. Yes, and um, by the way, uh, let's uh, let's be honest here with uh, uh, our audience. And uh, I have to admit that uh, once upon a time I was uh, on the blacklist of Azerbaijan because uh, I have visited several times uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. I have seen the place. Uh, I have a lot of. Uh, I have to admit it. Yes, I have a lot of Armenian friends there, also in Nagorno-Karabakh. But this is not the matter of my emotions. I mean, I have also some, uh, uh, maybe not not as close, but also some uh, people who know in uh, Azerbaijan as well. Uh, so I'm not emotionally 
you know, somehow uh, connected with uh, any one of those sites. I at least think so, yes. So uh, if I would now, uh, let's say, uh, just consider the number of my friends and uh, the number of uh, good drinks, by the way, I had in uh, Stepanaket, I would prefer the Armenian side. But we are the, as you have noticed, we are here to analyze the geopolitical circumstances, the geopolitical situation, and geopolitical consequences, possible consequences of any given conflict, regardless of our, let's say, emotions and sympathies. Now that <laughs> that with the good drinks and with the extremely excellent cognac was, of course, a dagger deep in my heart, and uh, you know. <laughs> that uh, the media of Azerbaijan was once putting an article about me, uh, Manuel Oxenreiter, and then something like the return of cognac diplomacy. Huh? So um, uh, I am, uh, I'm, by the way, I think I'm still blacklisted there, but that shall not bother me. Um, by the not... way, I, I, uh, if we are talking about such uh, funny stories, uh, I have once met uh, the former prime minister of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, who is now, or who, who used to be an ambassador of Azerbaijan in, to Poland, to Warsaw. And uh, it was after my visit, several visits in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. And, uh, well, uh, we talked a little bit and he claimed that I have some Armenian, that I must have some Armenian roots, that I'm so uh, supportive for Karabakh and so on. So uh, I like, I would like to make a disclaimer. I have no Armenian roots or Armenian family. Yes, that's also important. Just cognac in your blood. <laughs> that's, 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 that's all. But, 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 but really, let us, I mean, let us analyze, analyze the case. What, what do we have here? We have uh, first of all, two, two states in Southern Caucasus, which both became independent after Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, in, uh, 1991. We have uh, within Azerbaijan a territory called Nagorno-Karabakh, which is, uh, and always was, we have also to say, uh, more than 90%, I think right now 97% settled with uh, ethnic Armenians. So we could say it is um, really almost from from the ethnic part. Uh, th th there are no so 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 many other other people living there. Um, we can say it is uh, historically Armenian. We who, who, you were there. I was there. We saw uh, you, we saw the, the old monasteries, uh, the Armenian history, and it is for Armenia itself. It is more. Um, uh, some square kilometers land at the border or, or abroad from the border where it is just about having it or not. It is for the Armenian identity uh, overly important. And I think we mentioned it already in another podcast that a lot of Armenian politicians are actually from Nagorno-Karabakh, so, so uh, who are now in Armenia and, and doing a political career in Armenia. We have on the other side Azerbaijan, uh, also, country as as I said already became independent uh, with uh, the borders which were made during Soviet times. So Nagorno Karabakh was within Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan is claiming for its uh, territorial integrity. So we have the. By the way, this is the conflict we are almost. Uh, this inter interesting for our listeners. The conflict. The all. Always the conflict, which is in the background, we are speaking about Mateusz and I, is the conflict between the self-determination of the people on the one side and the integrity, uh, the territorial integrity of the state. Uh, interesting. And until today, although we know about these conflicts since years, until today there is no solution for this because these are two fundamental rights which are always competing with each other. So what happened after uh, the collapse of Soviet Union, um, the Armenian side did a, a military campaign 
out of Armenian flew liberated Nagorno-Karabakh and Nagorno-Karabakh became an independent state, of course, not recognized by anyone, but by Armenia, while uh, Azerbaijan, of course, didn't recognize and always said this is uh, a separatist territory within uh, as, or on a Syrian soil. I think that is was a very neutral description. Would you add something or would you correct something? What I said, can we can we describe it like that? You have just told that there's no solution of the conflict and of such conflicts in general, right? I I don't. Do, do you know a solution? Is is there until yes, today? Some, some 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 people claim that the, there is one one solution. You know what? Uh, to re-establish Soviet Union. <laughs> So. Yes, exactly. That's the only way. That's the only way. I mean, to put all those countries with their Maybe. nationalism and so on uh, into one country, one integrated country. That's the only solution. Yes. So integration is the solution, by the way. Uh, anyway, uh, of course, Azerbaijan and Armenia would agree to this today. Well, uh, uh, they already have. Uh, a strong partner and uh, mediator in Moscow. And so <laughs> as they have already agreed for a military presence of uh, uh, of this mediator uh, from uh, Moscow, perhaps in some time they will agree for a kind of integration. Uh, Show I'm your not hands. Talking... They must be now full with Soviet rubles. Show your hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, anyway, no, it's, I, I mean, this is not just a joke because uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, we had uh, some processes uh, after the fall of Soviet Union, which were quite uh, inevitable, yes? I mean, the uh, disintegration of Soviet Union is not over, uh, we can say. We can say that uh, all those conflicts, which are the legacy of uh, the downfall of Soviet Union, are still continuing in different places, yes? Yeah. So uh, this is not a process which which has already finished. It it has consequences all around. And but, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. Sorry, sorry. If I if I if if I have now if I have now to interfere because uh, what you say, okay. Uh, if if we take now a, a very extreme solution, let us say, okay, for South Caucasus is this, but it is of course not a general solution because what do you what do we do with uh, catalonia what do we do with south tyrol what will you do in poland with uh, the silesian uh, separatist or independence movement of course you or you can make soviet union a world republic i mean <laughs> that is um uh, it's a brilliant idea yes. <laughs> i think i think i get now to the core here <laughs> what we are talking about no um but that is what I what I spoke about. In 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 general, we have this competing. Uh, Manuel, but but we cannot compare those issues because uh, I mean uh, uh, the things with uh, Catalonia, with uh, Scotland, with several other countries in uh, uh, Europe, which uh, have their independence, are not connected with the artificial borders which were drawn. Yes. And uh, in this particular case, I mean, as, as with many of the cases in uh, former Soviet Union, some of the borders, like in Crimea, let's say, yes, some of the borders were artificially drawn by uh, different uh, Soviet leaders because they were just moving one territory within the territory of, uh, uh, of one country of, of the Soviet uh, uh, state, yes. What border could be more artificially drawn, for just as one example, than the border of South Tyrol, which was uh, simply a thing after World War One, it is a total. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes, but 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 this, is a, but you know, this is a kind of bilateral issue, yes, between uh, between let's say uh, two countries more or less, yes. And uh, when it comes to all those uh, drawing the borders in uh, uh, in Soviet Union, yes. Uh, it was as a general, as a general principle, that the borders were uh, well not so important. Yes, that's why people did not pay any attention 
to such things as uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh case, yes? And by the way, there were no, uh, why I was talking that the Soviet Union would be a solution, there were literally no conflicts in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Azerbaijan itself, in the Azerbaijani Socialist Republic, Soviet Socialist Republic, you had no ethnic uh, conflicts between the Azeris and uh, the Armenians. I mean, the Armenians used to live in Baku also. And yeah. it, it, until, until the late 80s, it was not a problem, yes? I mean, the people lived, I, I have, I have talked to several people uh, now, now uh, elderly people who remember all those Soviet times, uh, and uh, they perfectly remember that they were neighbors, yes, that they were even friends, that their kids were playing on one playground and so on, yes. And suddenly, and suddenly, a uh, kind of ethno nationalism was ignited by uh, those people. I mean, Gorbachev here, it's without any doubt. I mean, uh, Gorbachev agreed to create the so the so called national fronts or popular fronts in uh, uh, different soviet republics the guys who uh, were uh, creating all those fronts came from the communist party but, but let's say from the ethno nationalist circles of the communist party like uh, uh, in armenia like in uh, azerbaijan as well azerbaijan was uh, by the way a very good example because it was strictly, uh, let's say, ethno-nationalist uh, uh, in those times. And uh, they have ignited those conflicts. But this is because of the policy of Gorbachev, uh, who uh, let all these things happen already in the end of the 90s. The first mm -hmm. ethnic cleansings you had in uh, Azerbaijan against the Armenians were in 1988. So it was uh, three years before the fall of Soviet Union, by the way, yes? So it had already started then. The Baltic states, there it started and then it spread. I, I mean, I, I, I know, I know the history, and I mean, it's it's important to to remember and to mention it. But I mean, the the gin is out of the bottle. Yeah? I, I doubt you can trust. <laughs> it is like like uh, squeezing toothpaste back into the tube. That is, it's not possible. So. Uh, I think we have now to see, to really to see what we have. And um, um, so let you, you agree that we, that we speak now again about, about more the presence, what we, what we have, what, what is uh, happening? Because I mean, one of, one of my first thoughts when the war started, when, when the war started, which was something like it was always in the air, but uh, you remember there, there is the Minsk group. They were talking and talking and talking since mid of the 90s. The Minsk group was uh, meeting. Armenia and Azerbaijan, both countries complained that there is no step forward, no development uh, at all. But what was always said of the Minsk group is that uh, talking is very important because as long that when they, as they talk in Minsk, they are not shooting. Um, that is why uh, it must be very interesting, the development in Southern Caucasus, also for the republics in uh, eastern, in former eastern Ukraine, for Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic, who have also Minsk groups uh, debating and discussing the status and all the questions. And there we say, well, as long they speak in Minsk, as long there is no war. But what, what's one thing what we have to learn is now that Minsk is not all protecting from a war. I mean, what happened, happened despite of Minsk. And uh, I think with the war, the last, last useful point of talks in Minsk was falling apart. Or what do you think? Is this well, the, 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 the Minsk group uh, consisted and consists of uh, the countries which have uh, uh, very little importance now, their geopolitical importance. And uh, some countries which have real geopolitical importance are not present in the Minsk uh, group. This is very important because uh, uh, there is France, for instance, in the Minsk group, but uh, there's no Turkey in the Minsk group. And to create, a, a, let's say, a forum uh, for the solution of this conflict, 
a kind of effective, uh, efficient forum, you would have to include Turkey. Whatever you think about the Turkish authorities and uh, their geopolitical strategy, yes, Turkey, okay. Turkey is an important actor for Azerbaijan, yes? And Iran, you so, would uh, have also. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, exactly. Iran, Iran is another player, yes? And uh, in, the, in the Minsk uh, uh, group, in the Minsk process, you uh, don't have at least two uh, important reg regional uh, powers uh, represented, so Turkey and Iran, and you have, well, okay, I understand that uh, uh, France wanted to be um, represented because of uh, traditional good relations between uh, France and Armenia, because of Armenian diaspora in uh, France and, and so on, yes, uh, that might be an argument. I don't know what what the United States are doing there in the Minsk group. Yes, I mean, if you if you look at the map, <laughs> uh, by the way, but 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 yes, the the I mean the the whole conflict uh, cannot be solved with, without active participation of uh, three countries: Russia, Turkey, and uh, Iran. That's uh, that's very obvious. Yes, for me. Uh, there are no other players there. I mean, there are no other players who are capable of uh, of a direct intervention there, in case something goes wrong or to to in case someone needs to go the peace there. Yes, so uh, that's why uh, I agree totally. Uh, but on the other hand, you have told very important thing now that uh, there was no progress. Uh, well, actually, I think there was some progress lately, and uh, let's. Uh, start with one fact, very important fact, that uh, since 1998, Armenia uh, was governed by the people from Nagorno-Karabakh. I mean, first it was uh, President uh, Robert Kocharyan, then it was uh, the President uh, Serge Sarkisian. They were bo both born in uh, Stepanakert. They uh, before they became the politicians in Armenia, they were the politicians and uh, high-level politicians and officials of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. Uh, why I'm talking about that? Because they have perfectly understood the nature of the conflict as such. Yes, and uh, uh, in 2018, uh, there was uh, just before a coup d'état in uh, Armenia. Uh, it was uh, already arranged with the participation of Moscow, of course, and the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, uh, that there could be a compromise when it comes to some parts, not of Nagorno-Karabakh, but, you know, of this uh, security zone, which is between Nagorno-Karabakh and the Azerbaijan, and which was controlled by the Armenians or by Nagorno-Karabakh army. So uh, it's very, very symptomatic, I think, that uh, the Armenian politicians who are uh, coming from Nagorno-Karabakh, understanding the nature of the problem, uh, wanted to already wanted to make some progress or compromise. Mm -hmm. And when this guy, uh, who is now a prime minister of uh, Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, uh, came to power uh, as a result of coup d'etat in uh, 2018, late 2018, uh, we had uh, mm, a complete, total rejection of the, mm, let's say, uh, of those uh, fundaments uh, uh, for the compromise, which have been already constructed before by uh, Serge Zarkisian and his administration. This is a very important thing, because uh, Nikol Pashinyan is not from Nagorno-Karabakh. I don't think uh, he understands the problems of Nagorno-Karabakh as such. Uh, then I don't think that uh, that he uh, is uh, or that he was totally independent when it comes to ma making some decisions. Yes, I mean uh, Ilham uh, Ilham Aliyev, the president of Azerbaijan, uh, has uh, very openly and clearly stated that uh, Nikol Pashinyan is a guy of Soros. Yes, yeah, and that uh, then there was a coup d'état or a color, color revolution in Armenia. Uh, which uh, brought to power the people of, of uh, Soros, of the West, and so on. We also perfectly remember that Nikol Pashinyan uh, has stated several times that he's not so keen on uh, uh, and not so glad with the Russian forces stationing in Armenia, 
and so on and so on. So he was distancing himself from the only country which could guarantee the safety and security for, of, of Armenia from Russia. Because as I, I think, I suppose that he was under pressure of some of his, uh, uh, let's say, Western partners. And when, uh, when the problems uh, appeared lately in um, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, he didn't get any support of the Western partners. Yes? Yeah. He might yeah, feel this up. But, but this is the result. Uh, I mean, Armenia, due to its geopolitical uh, position, has only two natural friends. This is Russia and this is Iran. Potentially also Iran, yes? It cannot count on the West. Uh, I mean, of course, we can, uh, let's say, I was in the parliament when we uh, took uh, took up the resolution about the genocide of Armenians in Turkey, in Osman uh, times uh, Turkey, and so on. On the symbolic level, of course, we can we can support. I mean, France can support, the West can support, and so on. But when it comes to the military field, to the military confrontation, the only guarantee for Armenia uh, was and is uh, Russia and potentially also Iran. I think. And you know, I mean, uh, my my. I, I also followed these events, and that is, I mean, um, you, you you don't have to go back so much in history, but you can just look, for example, the Georgian war is also a perfect example. Uh, Georgia against Russia is a perfect example. I think uh, the only thing the Americans did uh, was going to the airport, flying out of the country as long as the war. And we have, uh, you, you know, we have always a little bit the joke for, for such a constellation of powers. So when you reject the power which can really protect you and try to exchange it by a raumfremde macht, yeah, extraordinary power, uh, we say we say always maybe someone should call in Poland 1939 because uh, they know pretty well they were relying on the promises of the British, yeah, uh, who didn't keep them and, against and, and of the French and of the French as well. And what did they do? Nothing literally nothing they waited they didn't they didn't attack germany that is what uh, i think they, they didn't do two things uh, they promised to attack germany in in the moment but they just declared war and they promised poland the delivery of masses of weapons which never arrived because they of said course. oh now we now we need them ourselves so uh, that is why we say someone should call in poland 1939 and and ask how these things are but um i mean anyway uh, I mean, we don't need we don't need Aliyev to absorb Soros in Armenia or or in, in 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 other countries. I think it was clear from the beginning that that Pajinyan was trying. I don't know on the I I don't know how to describe such a development. He was definitely trying to bring Armenia as close as possible to European Union. Also in the policy to somehow to adjust the country to the demands coming from the European Union. By the way, demands the Russian Federation never directs against their um, alliance partners. The Russian Federation totally respects in these things the state sovereignty. That is the, never the case with US and with Europe. There come clear demands. I mean, we, we can speak about all these things like gender mainstreaming, these uh, super liberal human rights interpretations and so on, which can only weaken a country like Armenia. And uh, the timing of, of the war, um, I think it was almost in the air because I think Armenia was never so weakened down as it was now after the summer. Um, and I think the whole uh, COVID uh, thing and uh, the lockdown gave the Armenian industry and the Armenian economy simply the rest. So um, that must have been almost like an invitation for Azerbaijan now to solve it. Now to wait again 20 years. What do you think? Uh, I mean, uh, the difference between the potential, the military potential of Armenia and Azerbaijan was always yes. huge. Yeah? I mean, the the military, the sole military budget of uh, Azerbaijan is, I think, several times bigger than the whole budget, state budget of Armenia. Yes? So we cannot compare those two countries. 
when it comes in terms of uh, funding and uh, and support. Uh, now moreover, I as a Benjamin, please, please, sorry. Now, exactly, that is was was very. Now, I want to ask you something. Uh, if we take this into account, to think that. Azerbaijan was waging war for six weeks with a modern war machine in comparison to Armenia. And again, it, it, again, it reminds me a little bit if we compare the, the, the German-Polish war. Yeah? I mean, Poland had in 1939 still a horse cavalry and they were riding against German tanks. Yeah, just, I mean, we can a little bit, little bit take this, this comparison, but if we take this comparison, um, as far as I know, how long did the war Germany-Poland take? Four weeks, six weeks, four weeks, right? Oh, six, six weeks ago, six weeks. Mm -hmm. So after six weeks, the war between Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh also took six weeks and, Nagor and Azerbaijan didn't manage in these six weeks to conquer the whole territory. What does what does that tell us? I mean, I know in Azerbaijan they are celebrating the victory, um, but uh, I think they must be afraid of any strategic analysis because a six weeks war and they really didn't. They were very good in the plains. Uh, in Manuel, I, I I'm not so sure because uh, uh, first uh, first and foremost, of course, we have to admit that. Uh, the Armenian uh, soldiers, particularly the soldiers of the Nagorno-Karabakh Defense Army, uh, were definitely more motivated yes, to fight because they were defending yeah. their lives, yes, and their own territory. That's uh, that's one thing. Uh, on the other hand, the other thing is that uh, uh, Aliyev is not a madman, yes. So uh, I mean, he had to be. Uh, very careful uh, because any mistake, I mean, in the very, very last days, they have shot down a Russian uh, helicopter. Uh, the Azerbaijani army has done that, yes. Uh, nevertheless, if they would make some more mistakes like that, it could be very dangerous for Azerbaijan as such, yes. So, uh, concerning the fact that, uh, yeah, you know, the territory there, I mean, it's mountainous region and so on, yes. Concerning yes. the fact that the Armenia, that Armenia is quite close, yes. Concerning the fact that Armenia is a member of a, a treaty of a collective security organization, a military pact with uh, Russia. Uh, I think that Aliyev uh, had to be very cautious and uh, he couldn't think about the Blitzkrieg because during a blitzkrieg, they might, there might be some mistakes, like, uh, you know, shooting the Russian troops in the nearby Armenia and so on, yes? So I don't think it was uh, because of the, the fact that they couldn't do that. It's more uh, about the fact that they didn't want to do that and that uh, they uh, didn't want uh, and or they didn't get a green light for a blitzkrieg from Turkey as well, yes? So uh, I think sometimes it's uh, even more, uh, let's say, um, comfortable uh, to wage a war for several weeks longer and have time for negotiating and thinking about the results of, the, of that war, yes? So that, not, that, that is not the necessary, I mean, I, I pay my highest respect to to the courage of uh, Armenian uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, soldiers, because even the the, the Azerbaijani side has uh, admitted, I mean, in some media there that uh, yes, the guys were really very brave there. But uh, concerning the military potential, I think that they wouldn't have any chances if Azerbaijan would uh, decide about a kind of blitzkrieg uh, and if it if if it would throw all of its forces there uh, on Nagorno-Karabakh, yes. And also the Turkish support would also solve the problem, yes? Anyway. No, no, sorry. I didn't want to interrupt again. No, just uh, just uh, from this point of view, of view, I think so. But, uh, you know, you remember the town of uh, Shusha, I think, yes? Yeah. From Nagorno-Karabakh. Yeah. You have visited it. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, again, a, a historical place, very important, yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, when they have lost 
uh, Shusha, uh, which was for um, almost 20 years inhabited by the Armenians, I mean, since the end of the war in the 90s, uh, which, uh, I mean, there were a lot of investments, even a church, an Armenian church was built there, a huge one, you remember, a cathedral, a dome, yes. Uh, so psychologically, when they have uh, lost uh, Shusha to, the, to, to Azerbaijan, yes, uh, it was a kind of uh, psychological breakthrough for the Azerbaijanis as well, I think, yes, from purely psychological point of view, but also from the military point of view, because as you also know, if we look at the map, Shusha is uh, located just over Stepanaket. So it's a perfect Mount. place. Exactly. Uh, yes, on the mountain. On the mountain. Yes, exactly. So it's a perfect place to have an uh, artillery shooting on the on the capital of Karabakh. Yes, from there you can do everything. I mean, it happened in the nineties already. Um, that was at one of the, the most war. important battles in the war in the nineties when the Armenians exactly. captured. Yes, 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 yes. Because this this is a, a territory of strategic importance, I think. Uh, by the way, I think that uh, we'll publish also the, the more detailed map, yes, uh, we have uh, with uh, uh, of Nagorno Karabakh just for our for our audience, uh, for our uh, listeners to, to, to take a look at that, because it's quite interesting, uh, that the places we are talk talking about. And what we have as a result of, of all of this, I mean, as a result, I think that we have a a situation where uh, Russia has uh, uh, managed to confirm that it is a leading geopolitical factor and force in, in uh, Southern Caucasus, mm -hmm. because it appeared that only Russia is able to bring at least the temporary peace and solution of, of the conflict as such, uh, because we have the Russian uh, peacekeeping forces in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh now, because we know that those uh, peacekeeping forces were uh, positioned from Russia, from Ulyanovsk, I think, from Ural Mountains to uh, Karabakh in just 24 hours, which is also very impressive, yes. And uh, we also know that uh, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia have now to negotiate all uh, the issues, all the problems in the future about this conflict uh, exactly with Moscow, yes? And I, I think that in Baku they understand that, in uh, Armenia they, they understand that, in Baku uh, they have two alternatives. I mean, they have one alternative is to talk and negotiate directly with Moscow when it's such to, when it comes to such issues. Yeah. And uh, the other alternative is to negotiate with Ankara and ask uh, uh, the Turks to call to Moscow. So uh, I think that it's more wise and uh, rational for, for the Azerbaijanis to uh, directly negotiate with Moscow than to do it via Ankara, yes? So this is the, I mean, the geopolitical result. I, I really see that Russia has uh, uh, won another part of uh, geopolitical uh, uh, let's say competition in in another region, uh, without even giving one one shoot, without without any soldiers uh, dead and so on and so on. Yes, I mean there were dead. I mean some soldiers died. Uh, those those who were uh, shot down by the Azerbaijani, Azerbaijanis and and were flying the helicopter, the Russian helicopter. I think two or three people. So at that cost, two or three people. Yes, uh, Russia. Uh, again, uh, made its very strong political stand, geopolitical stand in uh, Southern Caucasus. That was a masterpiece of uh, strategy and uh, diplomacy, I think, and when it comes to and Moscow. Again. And I think we, we agree that if now not a major change happens or a major event, that uh, the Russian troops will stay in Nagorno Karabakh at least the next 20 or 30 years, that this is now a fixed thing for two. Till, till, uh, till, till the new Soviet Union will be created. <laughs> Show your hands with the Soviet rubles. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, there was a, like, <laughs> there was, 
Yeah, but I mean, if we the the point is, um, what what will it do now? Also, with uh, with the two countries we we are speaking about, if we if we look into the future, I think, of course, the Aliyev regime uh, was stable before and is now even more stabilized due uh, to to the military success what they had, and um, I mean. You know, we speak about an agreement, about the truth, um, but I think it is totally correctly interpreted in Armenia as a defeat and in Azerbaijan as a victory. Yeah, so they it's they 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 don't call it truth. There, for the one side is the victory. It's a, like a capitulation for uh, Azerbaijan. It's Armenian capitulation, and for the Armenian concerning, concerning the Armenian, territorial process, yes, definitely yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, if you if you simply compare what Armenia had uh, two months ago and what they have today, it is it is a it is a defeat. But um, when we say okay, Azerbaijan might be now even more stabilized than it even was, uh, what is happening in Armenia? We see there now there are I mean the people are very very angry. Most probably a lot of people who voted for uh, Pashinyan and supported him also before. Yeah, that is uh, very likely. We we saw pictures um, that the parliament uh, in Yerevan was stormed by angry protesters. I think they were even beating up some some deputies and so on. What what will we see now in Armenia? Uh, what what do you think? Um, is this now just uh, like uh, a little anger, lightning, and the thing things will normalize later on and they will get you know. I, I really think that the people in Armenia are starting to uh, think very warm uh, about uh, the times of uh, Sarkisian and uh, Kocharian before, yes? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, those guys, I know that they were controversial for, for several Armenians, uh, first and foremost, but uh, nevertheless, uh, first they were former uh, Politicians and also military commanders, by the way, by the way, uh, in Nagorno Karabakh. So they were the guys who, who really understood the the essence of the problem as such. Yes, and uh, second, uh, they were really able to establish uh, perfect connections with uh, uh, very influential circles in Moscow. So they were able. Uh, to get uh, the highest level guarantees of uh, the security of Armenia as such from Moscow. Pashinyan mm -hmm. is unable to do that. I mean, uh, if I would be an Armenian, yes, I would really call that guys back. Uh, I yeah. would really ask those guys like like Sarkisian, like Kocharian to, to come back and uh, to take the power, yes? I, I don't know. I haven't read any recent polls, opinion polls in Armenia, yes? Uh, but uh, as uh, when it comes to my opinion, I, I think that uh, Kocharian, Sarkisian and people like them should uh, perhaps create a new political entity, a new political party, and that this new political movement could uh, take power in, in Armenia very soon. Because in the opposition now, uh, actually, if you look at the political scene, the party system of Armenia, uh, you have a lot of guys who are criticizing uh, Pashinyan uh, as a guy who lost a large part of Karabakh and its safety and so on. But on the other hand, uh, those guys make the same mistake. I mean, those guys are also speaking, speaking like Pashinyan was about uh, uh, the strong alliance and cooperation with the West and so on and so on, yes? And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, right the reason why Armenia has lost now and Kabakh has lost, yes? So uh, I really think that uh, it's high time for, for the Armenians uh, for the future to think about, uh, let's say, true patriotic forces, uh, uh, supported or created by the guys who are really experienced in Karabakh politics and in Armenian politics. I mean, when when I started already speaking in, in historical parallels, um, don't don't use I mean, that was a little bit my analysis when I see now all the turmoil and uh, there are now 
all of the sudden seem many, many things possible, including the scenario you mentioned that Sarkisian is, is called back and that the old guys are called back. But um, I mean, I think, I, I think these events right now happening in the, in the last days and weeks are crucial for Armenia. I think they, these are is really now a, histor a historical point which happens very rarely to countries. Maybe, I don't know where, with what to, what to compare. Maybe also like for, for Germany after World War I was the Versailles Treaty, you know, where also the people sincerely didn't understand what what was there signed by the politicians and and why and you you remember that in uh, germany there was then the so-called dolchstos legende the the dagger legion uh, the politicians signed an agreement while the army was standing in the field and the politicians were putting the dagger in the back of the german soldier so that was back then so I mean, if we if we see all this and we have some lessons from from history, don't you think that what could happen now with Armenia is also that there will be not a lot of events now this year, next year, but within the next 20, 30 years that that this crucial event could be like really a, um, a political U-turn, a political change that um, the political elite of Armenia will perfectly understand what you said right now, that all this uh, trying to be nice to the West and to uh, implement uh, the demands uh, from the West just for, for some dollars or for some euros, that this is leading right into a catastrophe while, uh, <laughs> while always pushing back exactly that country and we speak about russia which is the only country really for which it is able which is capable to provide you security and to be a strong ally um, that this that this wasn't smart uh, especially from pashinyan but, but generally in in the last years that we could witness uh, maybe in armenia a major change of the political right. field yes. armenia authoritarian uh, or as we say in Europe illiberal republic like uh, we, we saw in Hungary that we will have a strong leadership which um, in Armenia has many other problems not just now the lost war it has the economy problem it has the corruption problem I mean these are things Pashinyan was promising um, to uh, to order and obviously didn't even order that so we, we have there yeah. also could be to uh, check this but don't you see that that could be now the time that uh, people will come to the top who will be able to order this and that Armenia could be strengthened by this loss that it is like a wake-up call for the country and that we will see maybe in 20 years an Armenia which is maybe when it comes to economy uh, can cannot compete with Azerbaijan but maybe in terms of um, let me call it uh, the organizational degree of society. I want just to uh, remind, if we look at Europe, between the wars, we have countries without any resources. Uh, Portugal, under Salazar, yeah, who really managed the country in a, in a recovery. Um, also, Germany was recovering. We have Austria uh, with uh, what we, we call today the Austrofascismus, yeah, the, the Austrofascismus under under Dolphus. So we we have different models, all authoritarian models of recovery. Don't you think that that could now happen in Armenia? Of course, it it will it will call itself. It will be maybe something some populist movement or so, but maybe comparable to guys like Orban in Hungary. Yeah, or, or maybe also comparable to guys like um, in, in, in Turkey, Erdogan from, from the type of leadership. Do, do, do you think that this is possible and that Armenia can be within 20 years uh, all of a sudden a geopolitical player you have to calculate with and a very attractive uh, uh, alliance partner for Russia? Because we have to admit for the Russian Federation, Armenia is maybe today not the most attractive uh, partner, always complaining. Um, they they have their the military base. Um, do you think it's possible that Armenia will will recover from this in a way that we all might be surprised? Uh, well, I 
I'm rather skeptical because uh, I don't think Armenia has, uh, uh, is, let's say, sufficient uh, geopolitical potential yes, uh, uh, as such. I mean, uh, I'm not talking about the uh, political elites because uh, uh, political elites are also limited by by the limits, let's say, of geoeconomical, of demographical, and uh, other kinds of potential. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so for for the moment, being, I mean, of course, they can create a, a better functioning economy, a better functioning state, and so on, and that, that would be quite important. Uh, but uh, uh, I would like to to let's say to to make my last conclusions, which. Uh, uh, somehow taking us back to uh, some of my first conclusions. I was talking about uh, the solution, mm -hmm. uh, which would be a re re reintegration in the new into the new Soviet Union. Yes, and you know uh, now to be uh, to be um, uh, very serious already and uh, uh, to, to to point out what could be a solution in the future. Uh, the Eurasian <laughs> integration could be a solution. After we, <laughs> yeah, but 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 the, the the Eurasian solution as such is a solution uh, there. Yes, uh, the Eurasian integration. I mean, if uh, uh, we know that Armenia is the member of Eurasian Economic Union already, yes, uh, and only regret that Azerbaijan is not the member of Eurasian Economic Union, because all the issues like you know the. Uh, economic blockade between the countries and so on, yes, would be solved if both sides would be the members of Eurasian Economic Union. So of the integration bloc uh, created there by, by Russia, by Kazakhstan and several other countries, yes. Uh, that's why I really think that, uh, uh, well, uh, the integration might be the solution, or the only solution in the future. and. Uh, uh, let's say that uh, if I would be an Armenian, I would really like Azerbaijan to become the member of uh, Eurasian Economic uh, Union, yes, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that might really solve at least some of the problems. Uh, I'm not talking that they will become suddenly they will become friends and uh, that things will, will be as they used to be in uh, in the times of the Soviet of the, of the of the Soviet Union, yes, when they were neighbors and uh, friends and so on but uh, i'm just talking about reducing of the tensions and uh, one of the most uh, efficient ways to reduce the tensions is uh, the uh, common participation in a bigger integrational project a eurasian one uh, this is a solution when it comes to my opinion uh, but of course uh, these things could be understood by uh, by a political elite which is uh, pragmatic realistic and uh, doesn't have any uh, let's say false expectations when it comes to the role of the west i leave you with these uh, last words that sounded now a little bit different uh, like just <laughs> the soviet union and i you know i'm just concerned that you get arrested after the podcast if uh, they 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 hear that in poland that's that's all no but i i uh, totally agree to what you said but i want to add something else what is uh, i think also a very important condition and it's the same as for europe and uh, for other nations um, the region of Southern Caucasus has also to be totally de-Americanized, de as we say in German, de-Americanized. I think the Americans have to be pushed out. Any kind of influence of the US is absolutely a different situation. That's what I want to uh, this is the main message of all our podcasts. Uh, that's why I uh, totally agree with you. Yes, right. Uh, anyway, I, I think we'll be uh, coming back to the topic of uh, South Caucasus several times in the future as well, uh, because although the countries are small, the, their population is not so big uh, compared to other uh, European and Eurasian countries. The region itself, it's uh, I mean, it's quite fascinating and. Uh, also, its geopolitical role is definitely bigger than its size. Yeah. 
Abs yeah. Otherwise, otherwise it wouldn't be also such a topic. It would be just a war or a conflict. We most people wouldn't even know. But for our listeners, also thank you so much. This was a very long podcast, and uh, I think there are besides all uh, the analysis and all the, um, the 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 content we delivered about the conflict, there are two lessons. Uh, lesson number one is that. Uh, Matai, we can also do a very controversial podcast. We can disagree very much. And we see something else that anti Americanism un unites people again. You saw at the end, uh, we came together. Exactly. So uh, that is an important lesson. So if you are in a dispute, if you have some quarrel with a good friend, say something against America, you see you come together and you are good friends again. So Perfect. let us end it like this. <laughs> let us end it like this. And see you next time. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you. This program was presented to you by